the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Jesus Christ, our Lord, on this blessed Sunday, make us worthy to praise your resurrection with pure hearts and clear consciences, with all the children of your holy church. We glorify and thank you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Oh 
that we may praise you with purity and listen to your holy scriptures. To you be glory forever.
Peace be with you. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to St. Matthew, who proclaimed life to the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. Remain silent, O listeners, for the Holy Gospel is about to be proclaimed to you. Listen in in glory and thanks to the Word of the Living God. The Apostle Matthew writes, but the Pharisees went out, and they took counsel against Jesus as how to destroy him. And when Jesus realized this, he withdrew from that place. And many people followed him, and he cured them all. But he warned them not to make him known. This was in order to fulfill what had been spoken through Isaiah the prophet. Behold my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom I delight. I shall place my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. He will not contend or cry out, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not extinguish. Until he brings justice to victory, and in his name the Gentiles shall go. This is the truth, peace be with you. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. Forgiving us his words of life. Praise and blessings to Jesus Christ, our Lord and God. The Pharisees went out and they conferred together about him regarding how they might destroy him. Jesus was aware of this and left that place. Large crowds followed him and he healed them all. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. This morning from the rectory, I hear the construction work going on. It's been going on for months. But on this Sunday morning, they were working on the construction site once again. It's always notable because of the beeping of the machines every time they back up. And it made me think of the story of St. Dominic, the great St. Dominic in the 13th century. And when he preached in what's now southern France, at that time it was the county of Toulouse. And he preached among the Manichaeans, these individuals who at one point their ancestors had been Catholics. But over the generations, they had gravitated to this very strange religion that comes ultimately out of Persia. And they were working on a Sunday morning, these Manichaeans. And our St. Dominic was walking out that day on a Sunday, and he saw them weeping. They were in the fields, they were cutting their, their hay. And so they were cutting the bundles and placing them in their arms. And he started to preach to them in the middle of the fields. Catholics, they were not. It's already hard enough to preach to Catholics. Difficult to imagine to preach to the Manichaeans. Now let's support you, St. Dominic. And he told them, this is the Lord's day. This is the Sabbath. We set aside manual labor. We devote ourselves to the things of the Spirit. And this is a serious and a grave obligation. And they started to make fun of him. They just mocked him. Made fun of this priest standing there in his white, in the middle of the fields. And they turned around and they just started to continue to work. But this time when they turned around to start cutting the grain and to make the bundles into their arms, the grain started to bleed. And there was blood now all over the field from their cuttings. That was the beginning of the conversion of men. We forget about the Sabbath as being one of these days in which we have a serious obligation of the day. We set aside the manual labor in order to be free for the things of the Spirit. Not because manual labor is bad. Now we've almost seen 
pictures of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, holding the Christ child, the brown scapular, and in front of her is this ocean of fire. And there are individuals being taken out of the fire. Of course, it's purgatory. These are the purgations, and through the mercies of the Mother of God, interceding for them to bring to a conclusion this purging, this purification which is required. And we forget that during our lives, how God desires to speak to us is one of gentleness. He does not desire any more than a human parent. At one point, our Lord says in the Gospel, which among you, if your child asks for food, asks for a fish, you give him a rock. You give him food. And he says, if you, who are evil, he throws that in too, know how to give good things to your children, how much more your Father in heaven. This is the meaning of today's Gospel. It is the fact that God communicates peacefully through the Messiah. And His desire in our individual lives is also to speak to us in a peaceable manner. So in this episode that we have in the Gospel of St. Matthew chapter 12, we have this constant conflict between the Messiah and the people around Him. Because He is not saying what they want to hear any more than St. Dominic told them what the Manichaeans wanted to hear on that Sunday morning. A miracle causes them shock and awe. In this instance, this friction over our Lord's teaching, we begin with the mind, which is actually about halfway through the chapter 12, in which the Pharisees begin to decide a way to destroy our Lord, to stop this rabbi of Nazareth. And our Lord knows what they're doing, and He simply leaves that place. This is the worst thing that can happen to us. That we turn away from God, we turn away from God, we turn away from God. Speaking about Sundays, you look at the sparsity. When I arrived, they said, Oh, Luna, the numbers always go down in the summer. Why? Well, people go to the camping, and they go to the beach, and they do sports. It's like, well, none of those things replace God. And to not be at the divine liturgy celebrating the resurrection of our Lord in this work of redemption is a very grave sin. It's a mortal sin. So the individuals who will leave and just simply do this because it's a pretty day, their conscience is to be burdened by the fact that this is gravely sinful. Now, I suppose if the first day we went to the beach on a Sunday, skipping Mass, and one of our children were like burnt to a crisp by a bolt of lightning, we get the message this is probably not the right thing to do. The same way that the Manichaeans on that morning, once the grain started to bleed, the human blood, they realized, okay, something is being said here which is important. But why is it in our lives that we force God to do things that we have to be slammed against the wall before we listen. This is what's happening in this chapter 12. The Messiah, our Lord, is talking to the people who were created to receive Him, forming of Israel in order to receive the Messiah. And they don't like what He says. They don't like how He says it. And so the reaction is not to kind of refigure that maybe the way that they're listening is not correct. No. The reaction is to destroy. And we are told by St. Matthew that our Lord then steps away from that place, just goes away, leaves these people in their consternation. But we're told by St. Matthew that many people follow. The little ones, the simple ones, who know, who can hear, who understand that something is being taught. And they follow our Lord, and St. Matthew tells us, He healed them all. And we know, not just physically, but emotionally, spiritually, supernaturally, ultimately, this whole notion, as we've mentioned, of shalom, of peace. And that's why St. Matthew said, and this was done in order, and he quotes chapter 42 from Isaiah that he will not break the bruised reed. He's already half-hanging. He won't break it. This gentleness of the Christ. 
He will not extinguish the smoldering flux. This notion that the message will come from the by the Messiah is one of great judgments. He will not argue in the streets. You won't hear him haranguing on a street corner. The Messiah will not be using a soapbox in the middle of the park. That's the meaning of this prophecy of Isaiah, which is announced eight centuries before this moment of our Lord. So the question that always comes as we look over these weeks of the whole apostolic life and how God works actually quite mercifully, quite gently with us. As we turn towards the second come, we know this one is in severity and injustice. We have a moment of peace in which God desires to draw us closer to his sacred heart in a gentle manner if we listen. But because the listening always isn't so disposed, there is illness which is allowed to continue, there are great difficulties, there are conflicts which result because of our concupiscence, as St. James says. But it only apparently is in those moments of something dramatic that we really seriously become engaged to follow our Lord. Better late than never, of course. And many people have been converted through funerals. But why do we have to wait for death in something so dramatic? to lose a loved one when the Sacred Heart is continuing to speak to us gently and softly. All he is asking is that we place the Gospel in the center of our lives. Not that we are being and doing something religious at every moment. That we leave for a different form of consecrated life. That we honor today in St. Charbel, whose feast day is today. St. Charbel and others like him have taken to heart that the gospel is central, the gospel is the foundation, and the gospel is the goal, ultimately, and inspiration of our lives. It is meant to inspire everything that we do in following our Lord, even on the non-Sunday mornings when we're at the beach or on a picnic. These moments are meant to be inspired by our Catholic faith. What the saints Charbel and others like him do is they take that Ihidoyo, what we talked about over these last weeks, this single-mindedness and focus upon God, and they make it into their very lives. So that St. Charbel was born in 1828, and who dies in 1898, living for 70 years. As a young man, he enters into the monastic order, the Lebanese monks. And for 16 years, he lives within the community, being trained. But in the Maronite tradition, the goal is always that of permit. To be able to come far fully to a completely individual, fully 120% consecrated life of the Ikida Yutha, of the singleness of vision, to focus upon God in praise and in the sacred mysteries and in prayer and penance. And after 16 years of training, Within the community, St. Charbella asked for the ability then to become a hermit. And for the next quarter of a century, he lived as a hermit. Two men, one hermitage, up in the furthest part of the mountain, where he continued then in this hiddenness of life to give the praise to God in our name for those of us who don't. This is the purpose of the hermits. They remember God, they honor God, and they praise God for the other human creatures who do not, or who are busy. And so St. Charbel would come from his hermitage on occasion into the villages when asked by the superiors to bless fields, to bless houses. So he was unseen, but he was not unknown. His priest was known. And in our Maronite tradition, we come out of, we are the only Eastern church that comes out of an ascetic, monastic tradition. Our pride and our joy until the mid 20th century was that our Maronites were people who prayed and prayed long and who fasted and who fasted long because these lay people had gravitated around these monks and these nuns throughout the centuries. 
So where are we now at the beginning of the 21st century? Are we worthy heirs of men like Saint Charbel? And if we're not, well, what are we going to do this afternoon? What are we going to do tomorrow? What happens to our lives next week? Do we change them? Or do we continue in complacency? Waiting for one of our children to be fried by a bolt of lightning or to have the flowers in our front yard start bleeding in blood. What do we wait for to start turning to the Lord? Do we have to force God to do something dramatic? And this is the meaning of Fatima, with which we will conclude. Remember last week, Our Lady, July 1917 is the most dramatic of all, except for the great miracle in October. Because the message of Fatima is in July. It's not the dancing of the sun. The message of Fatima is what she tells to the children in July. That you must pray the daily rosary, 20 minutes a day, out of 24 hours, that you are to have devotion to the stainless, immaculate heart of the Mother of God. Come to an eternal heart to find peace, wholeness, well-being, salvation. 20 minutes a day and devotion to the Mother of God is not complicated. It is very gentle. And she said, if you do this, there will be peace. And as I told you last week, we would finish off with the second part is, what if you don't listen to me? And that message, unfortunately, is the more dramatic bleeding in the fields and children being fried by lightning bolts. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, this vision of the purgatory, the purgatory are for those people who die in the friendship of God, but who have been distracted throughout their lives, so they have not been focused upon God as their primary source. They are not disposed to enter the vision of light of the eternal hidden one. And therefore they must be purged. They must be purified. They must be cleansed. Purgatory is part of hell. It is temporal, it will finish, and these individuals will enter into the vision of God. But that's why we use the image of fire, of this purgation. We have no idea how the purgations take place. But we know that these individuals are purged, it's why we pray for the dead. Our Lady of Mount Carmel again is that maternal image to bring people through these purgations. Purgations which we are meant to live meritoriously in this lifetime. There is no merit in purgatory. Nothing is gained. It is purely dross and impurities which are burned off. When we do that freely through prayer and penance and fasting in this life, not only does it purify us and cleanse the human soul, it is also meritorious and brings us closer into the vision of God after death. The question becomes, do we want that? Or do we have to be slammed against the wall? And so when Our Lady at Fatima tells these children after this vision of hell that she gives to this seven-year-old, this nine-year-old, and this ten-year-old to see the burning souls of the damned, she says that if they do not listen, after having said, if they listen, there will be peace and many souls will be saved. But if not, there will be another war. Remember, this is 1917. There's still another year of the Great War. But she says, if they do not listen to this gentle request of devotion to a motherly heart and the 20-minute investment of the rosary contemplating the mysteries of the Gospel, if they cannot do this and will not do this, then there will be another and a worse war, which will take place during the pontificate of Pius XI. She uses the name, Pius XI is not Pope at this time. This is Benedict XV, who's Pope in Rome in 1917. She gives the name of the Pope in which this greater war will take place. She also says, I come to ask for the consecration of Russia. Russia stands out in a very unusual way in human history. Every Catholic people 
every Catholic nation who has left the Catholic faith has never returned. Parts of countries, southern Germany, Bavaria, part of below Lake Geneva, the area of St. Francis de Sales were. But no people as a whole has ever returned. There are only two Christian peoples who claim any kind of Christianity who were not originally Catholic. That's North America and Russia. Russia was converted and entered the Gospel at the same time when East and West were breaking apart. She says that I come to ask the, the consecration of Russia to my Immaculate Heart and then communions to be made successively on first Saturdays, five first Saturdays, as acts of reparation to spurn divine love. Russia stands out in a very unique way. And she continued by telling Lucia that if they do not listen, because by this consecration there will be the conversion of Russia, but if they do not listen and do this, she will spread her errors throughout the world. Now in the middle of the 20th century, the Catholic world liked to interpret this as the idea of the great dialectic between the evil empire of the Soviet Union and the good and beautiful West. And of course, this was false from the beginning. Because Our Lady did not say at Fatima that Russia would spread Soviet domination. She doesn't say that. As she is saying these things, these are five months before Lenin's communist revolution in Moscow, Petrograd. This is taking place in July, and of course it's the October revolution uh, just a few months later. She says that if these, are not, these requests are not listened to and, 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 and responded to, that she will restore her heirs throughout the world. What are the heirs of communism? Not the gulag, not Soviet oppression of Vietnam or wherever else. Communism is based on the philosophy of atheism and the materialistic dialectic. It is materialism and it is atheism. In 1917, she says, if you do not respond to what I'm asking now, and I will give you a miracle in October, so that what you know I tell you today is true. The errors which are spread in atheism and materialism, I don't know that it would be a great difficulty to ask anyone in this church, do you recognize atheistic living in the world around you? Do you recognize materialistic living around you? Materialism, I don't mean that we like to have nice pillows and soft chairs. Materialism in the sense that there is nothing beyond matter that exists. Human soul, mind, all that, none of that exists. What exists is matter, concrete stuff that we can measure in a petri dish. Those are the errors that we were warned of a century ago. And this is why when so-called the, the Iron Curtain fell and Gorbachev finished his work in the Soviet Union in the late 80s, where does Gorbachev move? He moves from Moscow to San Francisco. He goes from being a red to being a green, working for ecological purposes. The Iron Curtain comes down not because Russia's changed, but because atheism and materialism is very much the air we breathe. This part has already been accomplished. It's why Solzhenitsyn, when he came and he gave his famous Harvard address at commencement, and he told the Americans, you are just like Russia at the time of the revolution and you have to wake up in the 1980s. And the Russians and the Americans mocked him in the newspapers, they made fun of him, and he went from living in Vermont in exile, he moved back to Russia in the 90s. Because there was no difference. And Our Lady then said that these errors will provoke wars, they will provoke persecutions of the church, the good will be martyred, and the Holy Father will have much to suffer. And in the midst of all of this turmoil, Various nations will be annihilated. The annihilation doesn't come from the atheism. 
The annihilation does not come from the materialism. And this is the last point that I'll leave you with, and I congratulate you for your patience this morning. Otherwise, we have to drag this out for three weeks. Is it too long? The annihilation of nations, and this is a parenthesis, remember parenthesis, because this is me. I think that the vehicle of the annihilation of nations will be Islam. Not because every Muslim is wicked, of course not. But the vehicle will be Islam. Now our lady, the mother of God, could have appeared anywhere that she wants. Why does she choose such an obscure place in Portugal by the name of Fatima? In the entire Islamic world, Fatima, perhaps Ali, is the only name that is recognized by everyone universally with Muhammad. Of all of the sects and divisions there are in Islam, they all recognize Fatima, the daughter of Muhammad, as for the Shia in Iran, she's almost on equal footing with Muhammad as a prophetess. The mother of God chose to appear in a place, the only place really apparently in Europe at the time, which would have had a name which is recognizably Islamic. The name actually is given for a princess of North Africa who had married the king of Portugal and converted to Catholicism. Her name was Fatima. The city, the area is named after her. She did convert. But Fatima as a name is a name which is recognized as being quite Islamic. Very much so. Next, the name of your daughter Fatima, your son Muhammad, you can't do much better than that. And I believe that for the annihilation of nation, if this had been said in 1917, that Islam would be the spread for this. There would have been quite kind of consternated the wilderness. 1917, they weren't even drilling for oil yet. And yet, the message is still there. And I believe that Fatima is going to show its full message in this next century to come. The annihilation of nations, why do I say that? Well, I worked in Europe for six years. When I left in 2011, I knew that it was a good time to be leaving Geneva, Switzerland. The fact that Europe is burning now, I do not find as a surprise at all. I saw it, you can see it 10 years ago. Why? Because Islam has a vision of history, it has a vision of God, it has a vision, it has a vision. The French, the Germans, they have their materialistic, atheistic, nice way of living. As long as the power stays on, the water runs, and they can have their seven week average pay vacation in Europe, and they can make it to the Mediterranean, they are complacent. How do you oppose a vision with atheism, which is just emptiness. How do you oppose a cultural vision with materialism, which is just stuff? You can't. And to finish on this point is a reminder that when St. Augustine was alive in the 5th century, there were as many Catholic bishops in North Africa as there were in Europe. What does North Africa look like now? Do you recognize Damascus as being a Christian city? It was at one time, the entire population was Christian. Do you recognize Jerusalem as being a Christian city? It was at one time when the Persian pagans came in the early 500s, they ransacked a Christian city, dragged away the bishop, and dragged away tens of thousands of Christians into slavery in the year 514. Do you recognize any of this history? No. Any more than when I was walking with one of my colleagues through London. And I was telling him what a shame it will be. It's hard to imagine and it's tragic to think of the cathedral in Paris, Notre Dame de Paris, or Westminster Abbey in London as a mosque. And being the Englishman that he was, with a very kind of sardonic and dark sense of humor, he shrugged his shoulders and he said, but at least the buildings will be folded. 
They do not conquer because they are superior. They conquer because the West does nothing. These are all the warnings that are coming out of Fatima in 1917. And she says that in the end, though, my immaculate heart will triumph. Do you want it peacefully? Or do you want it in pain? In the end, my immaculate heart will triumph. Russia will be converted, with or without. But the without is going to be much harder. And there will be a certain period of peace which will be granted. And we interpret that that is the last period before the actual second coming. And then she gives her famous third secret. The third secret which to this point is still controversial. Apparently revealed in the 90s but still controversial. So I leave you with these thoughts today in St. Chardel. Do we move towards this great hero of the Maronite Church and try to develop for ourselves in accordance with the grace this vision of the service of God in which the gospel is central, fundamental, and the goal of our lives and live in peace and follow the peace of God's grace or do we desire to be distracted by our materialism and wait for our bodies to be slammed against the walls may the prayers of St. Charvel be with us always in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit Amen
Savior Jesus Christ, you have prepared the spiritual holy name of cross. Accept these pure offerings and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to approach your sanctuary with pure hearts and clear consciences. Grant us the peace that your only Son gave to his holy disciples, so that we may give one another that same peace with the Holy Kiss. We raise glory to you, to your only Son, and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever.
In your abundant mercy, you sent your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, into the world. He came down to us, and by the Holy Spirit became flesh of the Virgin Mary, accomplishing all things for our salvation. Kyrie eleison, Wabiano haurakun harshodi devavet haye, and sabe lochun mina harishotun, uparaku kadesh, vaksoya betalmi al kadoman, sabe kulam mene.
may make this man the body of Christ our God.
prophets and apostles, martyrs and confessors, and all who profess the Trinity of the true faith. Through their holy prayers and petitions, look upon us with the eyes of compassion, and may your calming and pleasant face shine upon us. Make us worthy to share in their reward and their inheritance, and may their shadow be a shelter of protection for us on that fearful day of judgment. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. O Lord, with the sweetness of your compassion, we see the souls of our brothers and sisters, the children of baptism who have gone to you in the true faith in this world of darkness, especially those for whom the sacrifice is offered. The mystery of your body could not be a pledge of life for them, a fire that consumes sins, and a burning coal that destroys transgressions. In your mercy, grant the rest of your dwellings of life and joy in heavenly Jerusalem. O lover of all people, grant us life, abundant blessings, and mercy, and forgive our sins and their
Savior who gives life to those who are taken and receive the blessing of the Lord. O Lord, we have approached your holy altar, the source of divine gifts. May we share in your holy mysteries and join the assembly of those who glorify you, that we may raise glory to you now and forever. The grace of the most holy trinity, eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Let each one of us look with reverence and humility and ask for the mercy of the Holy gifts of the Holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One Holy Father, one Holy Son, one Holy Spirit, bless the name of the Lord. For He is one in heaven and on earth, to Him be glory forever. Make us worthy of the Lord our God, so that our lives may be sanctified by our own love, and our souls purified by your own living love. May our community be for the forgiveness of our sins, 